What's up, podcast world? We got an awesome show today, straight out of the state that our presenting sponsors from. Y'all know Jack Daniels, the iconic Jack Daniels, Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey, Lynchburg, Tennessee. Enjoy it responsibly. Never, ever allow underage drinking. Thank you, Jack Daniels, for what you do for our brands, believing in the culture of the American outdoorsman, hunter, fisher, gatherer, provider. I'm so excited today because the man I have on the show is a music man. And I know what Jack Daniels feels about music. They work with the likes of Eric Church and Chase Rice and several other musical acts across the country and all different types of genres of music. And today we have Frank Liddell. When you hear the name Frank Liddell, you got to understand that there's a story to everything. And when I met Frank, the first thing I could think of is, man, I would love to sit down with this cat and just hear stories because he's got them. The experiences of being in Music City for as long as he has and the accomplishments that he has taken care of over the last three decades Welcome, my man, Frank Liddell from Carnival Music. Man, it's glad to be here. I'm honored, and uh, um, you're getting what you pay for on this thing. I have to warn you, but I'm really excited. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we've already met, man. It was so cool. I've heard about you so much. And then, you know, when I first heard, I think the first thing I heard of you was either Brent's podcast or Chris's. And I was like, I got to track that dude down, man. And, 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 uh, and uh, it's interesting when I hear have heard you before I met you talking about music, how a lot of music I've been fortunate to be a part of or, or involved with in the last, you know, three decades, as you said, man, it, it's always hit me a certain way. And it always, you know, it's hard to feel that in town amongst a lot of people because we're, this is where the business is. But when you're talking to somebody out in the world who lives across the country and the music is sort of hit them the way it hit me originally and and it's like yeah it is it is getting out there you know it's more than just us shoving this stuff down people's throats or getting a marketing plan or all that when it reaches people it means something so that was what's my favorite thing about about those podcasts i first heard you do that excited me and then to meet you put a name the face and all that uh, is really cool and and i hope that that i'll be better at a conversation and not just uh trying to conjure up um, no, I, so. it was great meeting you too and the the whole experience that day of the the shoot and all the festivities after um i love nashville and i i, I have a question for you but you know you heard the name of the podcast this life ain't for everybody do you have an idea of where i got that name because it's right in your backyard literally probably less than 300 yards from where you sit right now i was in nashville in 2008 Frank Liddell, and I went to Losers for the first time. I was invited to Losers for the first time in Midtown. And behind where the band plays, the house band or any special guests, they have this these letters up there in this weird font that says this life ain't for everybody. And on on my phone, Frank, I have a picture that I took that night in 2008 or 9, and I said, I'm going to trademark that name. So I did, and... But I want you to tell the audience when that those because in my my life, I wanted this life ain't for everybody to mean, hey, my life might not be for you. My life isn't anything extraordinary, but being a soldier might not be for everybody. Being in the record business might not be for everybody. There's all these different walks of life that make up our country and our, you know, our communities and everything. But in that instance, Frank Liddell, please tell the listening audience this life ain't for everybody. Why do those words ring true with the town of Nash, Nashville, Music City, USA? Well, just to start, my wife named Losers Loser. Uh, so, so, um, uh, and and, and I, I, although I don't go there much now, I have spent uh, um, several hours there, and um, so I get it. I think I, 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 I love that. Um, I, and I, I really feel like when you think about, you know, this life ain't for everybody, I mean, it can and, and should mean a lot of things, but it also should mean um, that, that you know, that it's not uh, like, a, like I never grew up and I haven't had the same responsibilities people have had. And sometimes I regret it. But I also when I talk about my life, I realize I just had more fun than anybody I know. But it's also so so in other words, like I've just kind of cruised through life working with music. I'm like, 
dude, that's cool, man. I want to go hang out with that guy. Or I want to hear this guy play the guitar. You know, that's the way it still hits me the way it hit me when I was 10 years old hearing a record for the first time. But to further it a little bit is it's also a responsibility because if, you know, I've always wanted and, and I've failed a lot of this, but I've always wanted it to not be, you know, a, a museum of, 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 music that nobody wanted anything to do with. I wanted to find music that hit me at gut level and, and then, and then to make it work. So it's one thing to walk around and say, this life ain't for everybody. And I do shit that nobody else does, but it's also this life ain't for everybody. Cause I have to figure out, I, I mean, I have a responsibility to with towards the people that I've worked with in different capacities over the years to say, hey, look, man, you know, just like my life and for everybody, their music isn't for everybody yet, but it's going to be. So it's 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 not it's, it's a bit of I can be a rogue. I can do whatever the hell I want, but I have to pay the bills, too. And I and I and once I take somebody uh you know once we sign somebody on a carnival or if i'm producing a record it's it's very important to me um that 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 we realize that re responsibility that we just took on did you go to nashville with the dream were you born in this part of the country were you originally there with the dream of being an artist and then one thing leads to the next and you become the producer how does it start and then i want you to get into the decade yeah, but, years and, and how it, you got here it's interesting though when I when I did move here, Harlan Howard, the famous songwriter, I met him once, and and I thought it was really cool. And, I, and of course, I met him many times after that. But he looked at me and he goes, "Man, are you a young artist in town? I want to write some songs with you." And I thought, you know, it's a real compliment. And, and and I thought that's cool. He thinks I'm an artist. I must look good. And then I realized over the years that he was, man, you know, he's smart. He doesn't know who's going to be the young artist in town. But he wants he wants in good with them in case they're going to be the young artist. I um, I grew up in Houston, Texas. And, and and strangely, I went to boarding school. I went to boarding school for two years in western Massachusetts and then three years right outside of Washington, D.C. And and I then um, I went to University of Texas, moved back home to Houston. And I think I was going to be a banker. Um, uh, that's what I was kind of trying to do. And, and, uh, because I just was completely, um, you know, directionless, but I love music, been around music all my life. And, and, and I, um, had got a job at a bank and then I went to this wedding and, and I met this guy who had, had named Brownlee Ferguson and he owns a company called Blue Water Music. And Brownlee was 10 years older than me. He had lived down the street from me growing up for a minute before he moved. I hadn't seen him since I was probably eight. And I saw him at the wedding and I asked him what he was doing. And he said, I'm, 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 uh, I have a music publishing company. And I didn't understand, you know, that, that everything was in Hol Hollywood or, or New York or Nashville. I mean, I had a vague idea of that, but I just thought he could be in the music business anywhere. And he had a company in Nashville. I mean, excuse me, in Houston. So I said, when he told me what he's doing, I said, can I come work for you? And he said, he was a little taken back. He said, well, come see me when we get to Houston. So when I went to Houston, I, um, I called him up and I made an appointment to go see him. And I, um, I uh, went over there in a suit and, and I, and I always kind of all I wanted to do, my dad and I had been to boarding school, like I said, been away at college for several years. And then, and all I wanted to do was just have a real job and put on a suit and go home and go by my dad's house and drink a scotch with him and have him think that yeah, my son's doing something. My son's got a job and he's got something going on. And so as soon as I kind of going down that road and I do get a job, I um, I get intrigued by the music business thing. I go see Brownlee and Brownlee says, um, you know, talk for a while. And he said, he goes, you know, I got a lot of work for you. And he said, but two things. And I said, what? And he said, well, I, I, I can't pay you much, if anything at all right now, you know, and that didn't phase me. I just thought I'd move back in with my mom. And, 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 and like I said, I've been gone so long that heck I just moved back in with my mom. I'll be fine. And, and then, and then, I said, what's the second thing? And he said, lose the suit. And that kind of bummed me out, you know. I was like, damn, man, I just want to wear a suit. 
And and what's interesting about that is is I, um, to get me in a suit now, it's an act of Congress, you know. <laughs> so I literally went to work for Brownlee. Um, and you can interrupt me anytime you want. If you have a question, you want to stop me. But I went to work for Brownlee. He had a music publishing company and he had a hit with a song by a guy named David Lynn Jones. It's a Willie Nelson, number one, living in the promised land. And he had had a, 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 he, so he opened up a Nashville office and I was in Houston, started a little record company for him and was going around trying to figure out the music business. And, and, and I, you know, scratching my head a lot, had no idea what I was doing. Um, but looking back, I, I didn't realize how much I was learning and how much fun I was having. And, and I also collected money for him and I'd call around and he'd say, he had, you know, bought an old song that had been a hit. And he would say, I think there's some money in Canada. You need to find this money. And it was amazing. Like I'd call this woman that the runaround I would get from people. So the two things I did was start this little record company and, and then also um, collect, help him collect money. And um, he had opened an office here and, and people that were working there after about a year left, went to work somewhere else. And I said, man, I'll take that job. And and I think that he ultimately hired me. And I think he hired me because the people he wanted to hire, he couldn't quite afford and didn't want to leave their job. So when I moved up here, he told me to call them. And, and he said, whatever you do, call this girl, Robin Palmer, when you, when you get there and, and she knows how to do what she's doing. And Robin and I are still friends today. But so I, I moved up here as a song plugger and, and, uh, had some songwriters pitching songs and, and trying to figure out uh, how to get songs on other people's records. And some of the early people I worked with were Jim Lauderdale and um, Kim Ritchie, a, a girl named Sandy Knox, who wrote a bunch of Reba hits. She didn't have those things, you know, before while, while we were working with her, she did. And then Al Anderson, um, a handful of people. And that's, and that's where I, I think I met Chris Knight when I was um, probably right. Not too long after I moved here. And I remember it vividly. So when you um, when you when you come from Texas, do you bring the Texas music scene with you? Was there a separate music scene in Texas like there is today compared like there's the Red Dirt, Texas, Robert Earl Keene, Hayes, Carl. But you mentioned Willie and then you got George Strait, who became a national icon. But was there a different music in Texas as there was in Nashville at that time? Yeah. And Rob, Robert Earl Keene was coming on uh, there. There wasn't the Red Dirt element of it wasn't there you know you'd had jerry jeff walker who had been really big in the 70s and um you had robert earl Keane, and i know there were others there was a scene in austin you know when i was probably too young to remember and, and michael martin murphy and R rusty were um uh, um bw stevenson there was a lot of really cool texas music but they didn't have it has the this you know mystery and lore about it but it didn't have the same energy you know that like willis allen ramsey they all probably made their records you know in la or somewhere like that and 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 and, and there's this mystery around all that music but you also had a lot of other weird music come out of texas and when i was there you had stevie ray vaughn um, a guy named Joe King Carrasco. I don't even know what you call that. And, um, but, but was really big in Texas, Joe Ely and, um, and the Flatlanders. And, and, and it was all there. There wasn't the same concerted effort. And most of them had records uh, coming out on record labels that were outside of, of Texas. Um, w one thing that's interesting is, is within, when I think of Texas music, I think of everybody that you've mentioned and, and, and uh, you know, um, but um, um, obviously there's, there's the country element and the kind of the singer songwriter, the Guy Clark uh, that was permeating underneath. But I also look at Stephen Ray Vaughan. I look at Beyonce and I look at my, my wife you know, my, and, and I'm married to Leanne Womack for the record, or even since then Miranda um, and um uh, Casey Musgrave, uh, George Strait. Um, uh, there's just so many interesting artists in a variety of genres that have come out of Texas. And Houston has had a weird scene with bands like 13th Floor Elevator, uh, um, um, uh, Kenny Rogers. It, it, so beyond just the red dirt element, there was there's eclectic music being heard in Texas all the time. So where that gets me is combine that combined with the fact that I went to boarding school and there's not a lot to do at boarding school except listen to music. 
And a lot of people um, um, would smoke dope because you can't hide booze. You know, some people get high and listen to um, to such a strange variety of music. So I'm sitting there and uh, that's where I learned the Allman Brothers. And that's where I learned um, the Grateful Dead. And that's where I learned um, Flat Scruggs, you know, and that's a lot of old George Jones and Merle Haggard things. So all those things combined, growing up in in, 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 in in Texas and then also having the influence of older people who would tell me, hey, you listen to shitty music. Let me play something cooler that that one day you wake up and you have you know a lot of music and you don't know why. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100 percent. I think that I think that it's unbelievable that you can that you have all of that influence based on the analogy of boarding school when you're supposed to be, it's kind of proper and, and kind of, you know, the, everything that's being taught at that time in your life, but you're kind of not really rebelling, but you're learning about all this outside. Let me ask you this real quick before you continue at the same time, are you discovering like ZZ top because were they, were they famous in Texas before the MTV oh, days Absolutely, they're from Houston and they're in, and I don't, you know, there's a lot of, stories and uh, um you know when i was younger i would see billy Gibbs around at bars and things like that um and and i don't i think he grew up a few miles from me or so I, i'm pretty sure in a little area called briar grove and that goes back to before boarding school so so you know my dad listened to music he made me learn how to play guitar he listened to old country music for the most part but he also listened to a lot of easy listening music which was not for me you know and um, and he actually made some records and wrote songs. He never did anything with them. Um, and but but so one day I hear you know Elton John for the first time. You know and and I'm thinking yeah, what in the hell is that? You know so I can remember like sitting around my dad him playing songs on the guitar um, all my life back in my earliest memories. And he would have these people friends come over and they would sing old Hank Williams songs and Hank Snow songs. And, and they had these singing groups. He sang old war, war songs from World War II and he was a military guy. And there's always music. And then I'd hear some weird like Puff the Magic Dragon. I was like, that's kind of cool. And, and, and so, but there, it was less that um, it wasn't that I took an interest later on. It's just that, that there weren't ways to find it. So when I finally got a stereo, I mean, you know, unlike today, do you have kids, by the way? I have a 10 year old daughter. Okay. So when I drove around with my 10 year old daughter, I listened to whatever the hell she wanted to listen to. When I drove around in the car with my dad, I listened to whatever the hell he was going to listen to. So one of these days I get a little stereo in my house and I get a radio station. I start, well, that's cool. You know, and here's something like the Doobie Brothers and some weird shit, but that's was all radio. And, and of course you couldn't buy a lot of records, but my cousins like for Christmas, we always drew names and always asked for records. And I would slowly pick up records, man. And, and, and strangely, um, there's a, a long, funny story. I won't bore you with it, but I ended up with the Who album, Tommy. I went up with a bunch of Elton John stuff, some uh, um, uh, The Who, Tommy, and and, and uh, um, I'm trying to think of ever from those early days, of an Elvis record, a three record. That was actually the first record I ever bought. So, so it wasn't like I could hear something and go, man, this is really cool. I'm going to go on Spotify or Apple and just listen to every bit of this shit, or I'm going to go to the store and buy the record because records cost a lot of money. And my dad was like, you know, probably I'm not buying you a record and you're not going to listen to that shit. So I would go through his records and sometimes I'd find something sonic kind of cool. And so when I was probably about in fifth or sixth grade when I first heard ZZ Top and, and I loved him and I never understood the Houston connection. But there definitely was that Texas connection, and everybody um, that I knew loved ZZ Top. That was just, uh, um, and it was, it was. I, again, I didn't look at it like, hey, these are the hometown guys, you know. Um, now, I also have to tell you that there's a radio station in Houston. It was KLOL at the time, and it was Album Rock. So you would hear the, you would hear. Um, Led Zeppelin, and you would hear a lot of ZZ Top, but you'd also hear Merle Haggard periodically in bands like Commander Cody. So, so I loved radio, and I know a lot of the hits from that era. But as as you could kind of get more, hear more music, it just became more interesting. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, and I can tell you where I was. I can tell you where I was sitting. Um, I told you I went to boarding school in Massachusetts, and I was. Um, um, 
pretty much done. It was the spring of 1979. I'm walking through this room and these two dudes, one guy had really long hair. His name is Lex Bear. We're playing the guitar. Like, That's cool. So I went in there and sat down. And, and, and I will tell you this, I was mostly listening to rock and roll. I was really disillusioned with all the radio stations had, you know, like post-Saturday Night Fever, to me, bad disco. And, I, and, and that's when I was just really listening to The Who, Led Zeppelin, and I just discovered Van Halen's first record. And I, and, 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 uh, and, but, I, but I'm walking through there, and I just sit down and listen to these guys, and they played, they played um, Mr. Tambourine Man, the Bob Dylan song. I was like, God dang, that's cool. And they played old man. And, and I was like, that's really cool. And I, they're looking at me like I was a dork and they, and, and they said, Hey, one of them guys I said, I still know his name. I've never talked to him again, either. Lex Barrett said, Hey, do yourself a favor. When you go home, get Bob Dylan's greatest hits and, um, and Neil Young harvest. So I go home and I get those two records and I sit there and listen to them all summer, you know? So there was, and I'm like, Wow, you know, then I go to boarding school in Virginia and these things keep happening. You know, somebody goes, Hey man, you listen to shitty music. I turn you on to the Almond Brothers, and I'm going in there listening to Chuck Lavelle play on Jessica. And and you know, I, I did it change my life. I mean, I ended up in the music business. I don't know. I, I, it's hard for me to say it changed my life, but I did end up doing this for a living, and I work with Chuck Lavelle whenever I can. So yeah, I guess it did. It, but all that to say, like somebody's listening to tells me, man, you need to go listen to Simon Garfunkel. Well, it's different. Again, there wasn't there wasn't um, uh, yeah, the easy access to music, but I would could go get a record or two. And then and and because you only have a record, you're not burning through things. You're just getting to know those records like the back of your hand, you know. And 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 you, they tell a story. And I fall in love with album cuts and thing. I fall in love with music that um, that I couldn't hear on the radio. That I would find just periodically through like digging through records, and then you hear something that speaks to you. And you and 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 uh, so that was going on for a long time. And all that to say it, it, it is, you know, I've I'm I know. Um, I mean. The album, I've always loved album cuts and, and I always thought that singles were like handshakes and album cuts was were for friends. Like, like, OK, you want to get to know somebody. And and um, interestingly, years later, I became friends uh, and, and still am, you know, good friends with Bernie Taupin, who wrote the Elton John song. And, and, the, and our relationship kind of um got a little bit more significant one time when I asked him about a particular song of theirs and he didn't believe I really knew it. And and I think he was a little dumbfounded that, that I knew that and several others that he, that including one, he couldn't remember. And I, I'm not the only person I felt a little bit like, you know, he probably just hadn't met a lot of people, a lot of his fans, but, but I also, you know, they spoke to me. It was, it was, B sides and things like that that just spoke to me. So when I, by the time I moved here, when you look at, um, like, did it make sense that I came here? Absolutely not, as it unfolded. But that I'm here now, it probably does make sense. So the things that I look at coming back now, like, like when I got to Nashville, I, I quickly was bored. Never been bored with great songwriting, but bored with the status quo. And and um, one of the things this town has to offer is it's just, you know, kind of the songwriting capital of the world. And not every great songwriter is from here, but 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 a lot of them move here. And um, another person I've discovered in boarding school is John Prine. And I and I, I remember at the, being at Home Depot when I first moved here and John Prine was standing there. I think he was looking at PVC pipe and I was like, holy shit, that's John Prine, man. It blew my mind. So in starting out in the music business here as a song plugger, I was working with Jim Lauderdale and at first thought is how am I ever get these songs recorded? And there's this girl working with me said, man, you're doing people a favor playing this song. You don't need to bring people what they, what they're already doing. They need to hear this. And, and it gave me a lot of confidence or more confidence just to double down and believe in great songwriters. And those things were here. Those were the elements of music that I love growing up. 
um, uh, you know, uh, those songwriters are here. So that's when I when I saw first heard Chris Knight or, you know, um, uh, when, when I heard Jim, of course, my company was already working with Jim. But when I heard Chris, I wasn't scared so much that what do I do with this? I thought, God, this is friggin' awesome. You know, Well, but before we get into him, because he's he's my he's my Elvis in a lot of ways, as far as what his song yeah, reminds me. Mm-hmm. But when you're in that point in your life, Frank Liddell, and you talk about the albums and actually becoming part of that album, it gets ingrained. You. Today, you hear you you go on streaming. I remember taking out the liner notes, looking at all the pictures, reading who was mm-hmm. responsible, reading who the photographers were, and then I started to realize, whoa! Under each album cut is a name or two names, and it was Guns and Roses' Appetite for Destruction. It always said Bailey or Rose, and it always said Hudson for Slash's real name. 100%. So I start. So as when you're talking like this, Frank. Are you discovering how important songwriting is early in your music career? Because I, I kind of did, and I've always had a fascination with the lyric and the words where I think today you're comparing it to Spotify or Pandora and streaming and all this. It's so easy, but nobody really takes the time to understand the whole album, the story, the project and the songwriters, right? Like, do, do, they, do they almost become forgotten in a way with the way music is today? I- I, I absolutely think, I mean, I, I hope it's just such an a, an art form that's integral to popular music that continues to live. And and I still think there's some young, great songwriters, and there's also a lot of talented songwriters out there right now. But, uh, but people listen in sound bites. I don't begrudge people that listen in sound bites. I think they're missing out. You know, I mean, I, they're, you know, think about when you heard first heard Guns N' Roses. And I don't even know the song, but then you go by Appetite for Destruction. And maybe there's times when you and your buddies are listening to them. But I bet you have that on in your car and late at night when nobody's around you. And you're listening to the beat, you know, be, you, if you're listening with your friends, you're going to play, play the hits. But then you just get to know the record. And there's this weird song on the side, too. And you're going, it, it becomes your favorite song. And those are the things that I just consider sacred about my relationship with music now did i understand that no because i didn't think that way but i did i I never was it's all about the song um i also love melody first thing that ever gets me is melody and and so um and and I wasn't great. Uh, um, I, I was no uh, literary uh, hero or, or, or strong man growing up. I was uh, I was more of a math guy. So, but but I did find myself if I like something with melody when when the lyrics added up, it always made it way more profound. So so it's. You know, you could say, well, are you a melody guy or a lyric guy? And I say, a, mer- a melody guy. But if you give me a bunch of melody with no lyrics or bad lyrics, I'm going to hate it. So I don't know what I am. I also am a little bit um, less like, like, it's interesting, you know, Bob Dylan had some of the greatest melodies me ever written. You know, I mean, he wasn't, I, I mean, I, I love his singing. I know he's not everybody's cup of tea, but um, I, I've never been a massive fan of, of just sitting there with people who sing monotone and kind of talk and it, look, not everybody who can't sing or play the guitar is Chris Christopherson or Bob Dylan and all that. So, so there are just pieces of different of the, the act of songwriting that as soon as I try to say, well, this one's more important than the other, I, 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 I correct myself. So over the years, I've realized just like that. Well, you know, what are they doing on this record that makes it so cool? And 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 I've been fortunate to meet a lot of quote unquote heroes over the years and musicians. And one thing you learn over the years is they're just fucking great, man. They're great. They, you know, it's amazing if and I and I know you've met a lot of people, and I ask you this, but but especially with musicians, that how um uh, how many that, you know, um, runs or, or parts or, or different, you know, licks or something that are, are on records. If you meet somebody that played it, they'll go, oh, yeah, I don't, you know, I'll have to go back and listen. Or um, I know what you're talking about. We were just playing. We were just playing that day, you know, and you're thinking, well, this guy had to come up with something genius. So 
the more I met musicians, the more I realized that that just great musicians, great songwriters, great singers. And the final part of it is producers, but also engineers. You know, I mean, a great engineer makes it. Make, uh, um, I, every uh, I've co-produced everything I've ever done for the most part with an engineer, and there's a reason for that. But but ev- behind anything I've ever done is worth a shit. The 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 person who was charged with recording and mixing it did a brilliant job. So all that to say is looking back at it when I came here and 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 where I am now, there are times when I thought, well, this is the most important part of music, or this is the most important part of music, or this is the most important part of music. But I realized that they all are integral. And and um and to but to that end, I think that a great song is just makes everybody's life better. I couldn't, um, I couldn't agree more. Do you have a, a dictionary kind of Webster's definition? And I want to, I want the audience to understand this because you hear a halftime show at a basketball game and a song comes on, or you hear a McDonald's commercial and it has a song that you recognize. Yeah. You hear things in movies, soundtracks of movies, Kenny Loggins, Footloose or whatever it might be, right? He's the king of soundtracks probably. But what is publishing Frank Liddell and how does a songwriter, how do you go about determining what a songwriter gets paid? Like Dean Dillon, for example, wrote, I don't even know how many number one hits for George Strait, but he also wrote like Tennessee whiskey that Ben Ratliff right. educated me on. Cause I thought David Allen Coe freaking wrote Tennessee whiskey, but then Ben's like, no, he did not uh, a girl named Linda something. And then Dean Dillon, but what is publishing and what does it mean to the, cause I know that you, you work in publishing a lot now and I want to go back to production and your mute, you know, your music, your record produ- producing, but what is publishing? Well, let, let, let me say that how, you know, I started off in publishing when I moved here and a great song. Um, uh, years ago, I ate at Ruth's Chris and I thought, man, it's the best piece of meat. This is the best steak I've ever had. And I was obsessed. This is before the Internet. I was like, how can they cook a steak like this? And then somebody explained to me. Well, that's the they get meat that you don't have access to. So there's that. They probably, you know, have a way to cook and all that. I, I understand that. But but it's the same thing with a song. Um, you know, one of the songs I was fortunate enough to be part of was The House That Built Me. And 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 uh and it's amazing how little fanfare went into recording it and et cetera. And even when we were done and nobody at the label got fired up about it. And, and, and I didn't think it fit on the album. Didn't think anything was wrong with it, but I get people will come up to me all the time and say, man, that you produce the shit out of that. Well, you have to know how I work, understand and know that that's not, I don't produce like that, but, but it's, what's interesting is a, uh, it's a glorified guitar vocal and it's not, it's more than that. I'm not pooping. I mean, there's great musicians on it, but there's, but the, you know, the drummer that made, you know, the first critical decision, he said, you know, he decided this thing doesn't need drums. So that he probably is the most important part of the thing. And, and all I have to say is I get credit sometime for that record, or that song, and and it was the song that carried the weight and everything else added up. I'm not saying, but, but, and, and it makes you realize sometimes that, that, you know, that song matters. So as a publisher, the way I always looked at it for a long time is, and it, it's, it's different now. You used to be able to make good money on an album cut. So in other words, if you have a song on a record 20 something years ago that sold 2 million records, um, even if it wasn't a single, you were going to make, I mean, I don't know what the, the rate back then was, maybe eight cents per record, or it was probably nine, but but um, per song per record, if it sold two million records, that's $180,000. It's going to go to the writer, and then, you know, it's split in half with the publisher. And But back then also, you usually didn't have more than two writers on a song. So now... Uh, and, and well, and now you have a lot more writers on songs, as you can kind of see, and 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 so it's split up between writers and publishing, and it's just, and 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 artists all record songs. They're all in on the writing. They're all recording their own songs, et cetera. And 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 there's teams of things. It's just a different world. So you don't see a lot of people recording 
outside songs. You know, keep in mind the Beatles recorded outside songs. So the Rolling Stones, so did Elton John, so did um, Willie Nelson. Um, and but it's just gotten something more where it's a lot of a business right now. And and I don't think you can have the same model that I had going into this. Um, I, I couldn't start a company that way today. I think it's uh, uh, we've been able to hang on and survive because we have had so many great songs that that have have done well for us over the year. But again, if I had a great songwriter back then and I was paying that songwriter X amount of money and I could get a couple of good cuts on some good records. And I was always, we're a small publisher. So I noticed that, you know, tree, which is Sony and, and Warner brothers, EMI, all the big companies at the time. And there were good companies and great songwriters wrote it, all of them, but they had mainstream country. They dominated it. So, so if I'm going to bring a song to somebody it's going to have to be different. And, 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 and because I know that when as they narrow down their pile of songs to record is if, if it gets further down, um, as it gets closer and closer to recording, they're going to have, a, everybody's looking for an up-tempo radio hit. Nothing, not, that shit's never changed. And, and, uh, but, but I always felt like if I had a great song, you know, um, that was in the pile and the artist had kind of all their their shit worked out, their marketing work, you know, their their plan. They were going to record a song for a reason because okay, got everything everybody needs. I love this song. I'm going to record it. So you get it on an album, on a Kenny Chesney album, or a or a George Strait record years ago, or Reba McIntyre when I was uh, working for Blue Water still. And 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 if it sold two million records. You're going to make money no matter what. It's also people are going to hear it around town and they're going to go, man, I can, man, that's a great song. And, and then sooner or later, what was strange is that, you know, when, when people didn't have to own a piece of everything, that all of a sudden a song like Angry All the Time or uh, that we had or a song like um, The Greatest Man I Never Knew that Richard Lee wrote for Reba, you know, songs that people just recorded because they love. They would on, go three or four singles deep on a record and all of a sudden the song, the handshake song. I mean, I, I mean, we get past all the handshake song and that song that's buried inside too. somebody would take a risk and put them out. And, and, and that's how. That was the theory that we built Carnival on a long time ago, and I've I, and I'm not bragging or anything. I, I'm and and I'm I'm not always happy myself. We have never through all the the you know the quote unquote bro country element of the last you know 10, 15 years or whatever. I've I still pretty much Carnival just has songwriters, and it's never been easy. Um, uh, but I do feel like we have, you know, some, hopefully some doors are opening up with, with, with what we have going on and, and, and that maybe the song will matter again, the way it did when I moved here. I'd probably well, answer any of your questions. hundred percent you are. And I, I, I think of a song that off the top of my head, you, we have a common th- friend in Brent Cobb. He, he's a, a, one of your writers. He's one of my favorite writers and I'm still getting to Chris, but Brent Cobb actually is the one that turned me on to rural route. Chris Knight and said that every time he hears that song, he tears up. Um, but shine on rainy day. You have a, a hold on this song because Brent sings this song and it's amazing to me. Your mm-hmm. wife sang this song and it's amazing to me, but here's my question to you. Leanne is a hit maker but at the time she puts this song out, this song doesn't become a hit for Leanne. And I'm just saying this out loud to get the, the reasoning of where this song goes from here. I feel that the whole world needs to hear this song. Leanne's version on the radio, Brent Cobb's version on the radio. Something needs to get this song to the masses because I think it's a genius cut. So does the song stop with Leanne? Is it done now? Is that song go nowhere except when Brent plays it live? So what's interesting that you say that, um, uh, well, first of all, when Leanne, when she started making records, I mean, you know, going back five or six years, if she said, if you look at country radio and, and, and probably radio in general and how it treats, you know, um, the, the, uh, you know, aging women, especially that they, you know, it, it's not kind to them. And I'm not, this is not a statement of any sorts, but my wife is kind of like, Look, I'm not going to chase this the rest of my life. I want to get on with making the music that I want to make. And I don't and and I would I hope 
that it gets played, but I don't want to do it just to get played and then have it not get played. You can look around and see what happens in this business. And 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 so there is an element of her. I'm just recording a great song. Um, and and um, but g- going back to it's interesting, like um, uh, I, when I was probably I don't know, 12 or 13, there's a song called Hooked on a Feeling. I, I'm hooked on a feeling. I'm high. And BJ Thomas had a hit with it. And I can't remember the name of the other band right now. They had a hit. They both had hits with it, pop hits with it. And and, and then you go back and look further and somebody would have a hit on the radio and then other people would cut it and respectable artists would record, you know, a song that that their buddy had out on a radio. It's just bizarre. And then somehow it got to where if this song's on an album even or it was a single, but 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 it originally but died. Well, maybe it's bad luck or maybe, you know, if it didn't work, I don't want to record it. And and uh and um and 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 ultimately, just if somebody recorded it, people would would be you know sh- would shun it, you know. But there's songs that have been recorded a lot and rewritten, like like the Gambler that finally found its right moment. I mean, I think that that that's just all music business, sort of like us kind of um, overthinking things, combined with the fact that a lot of artists now are writing their own songs. So the is somebody going to re-record that song again? I would hope so. And I think it could have its day in the sun. And the only people who the, the fact that it had been recorded a few times, because Andrew Combs wrote it and it's and he recorded it as well with Brent. That 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 just makes the story better because it is such a great song, and hopefully one of these days somebody does record it. My hope, and and I'm and I'm. Let me tell you this: I'm not holding my breath, but that again, like as I said earlier, if Willie Nelson can record outside songs, anybody can. Um, my hope is one day people realize that the money there's less money in publishing in this business in there and than any element of our business. And and uh, there's ways to make money in it, and there's there's money in standards and things like that. There's less money that that an artist can um, that a, a superstar artist is making less off of his or song her songs than they are of anything else. That it just somebody's hoping it just gets to the place one day where people just go, man. I'm, that song is so fucking good. I'm going to record it. It'll make their lives better. It'll make everybody's lives better. And I think if we get back to that, we're like, like, cause like I said, right now I could, we could pitch shine on rainy day around, but the odds are people aren't recording outside songs. So it will be hard for it to get recorded for that reason alone. And, and then on top of the fact that it's been recorded um, again, I'm hoping that in time that, that, live music that people playing instruments that real songs are, are become relevant again and that and that and that like the scenario you're asking about can exist you know that uh, I, but i i think it's mostly it doesn't matter that they've already recorded that song it, in the least bit as far as it becoming a hit down the road it it, it we do people do think it matters that does it matter does it matter how you pitch the song, Frank Liddell. And my question revolves around if you listen to Chris Knight and we're going to get into Chris, but if you listen to it ain't easy be a me, or you listen to shine on rainy day, the way that Brent Cobb sings it and the way that Chris sings it ain't easy be a me. Does that intimidate a potential uh, radio guy of going, well, I can't do it better than that. Why would I even try that? That is Chris Knight to its fullest. That's Brent Cobb style. Luke Bryan's not going to look at shine on rainy day and go, Wow, even though Luke did take a Brent Cobb song called Tailgate Blues that Brent sounds right. amazing on, that should have right. been a number one hit for Luke Bryan, even though it was never released as a single. It would have been a number one if he did, because that's one of Luke Bryan's finest songs. But does it ever intimidate an artist if it's not pitched the right way and they hear Brent sing that song and they're like, I can't do better than that? Um, um, o- over the years, I've seen uh, 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 it's a good question. And, and uh, unfortunately, uh, there's a handful of answers. Um, some people are intimidated. Some people, perhaps if they hear somebody singing a demo, if they don't like them, um, uh, they're singing or if they can't sing as well as them or um, 
you know, it, uh, or, or they the song, the demo pigeonholes a song they can't hear themselves doing it. I, I've known over the years, you know, like people um, would come to me and ask for songs, Jim Lauderdale songs years ago when I was working at Blue Water. Like, I want to hear some of these Jim Lauderdale songs that George Strait's recording, songs like that. And I would get, and these are artists that you know, and 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 I would get them in a room, I'd play them every Jim Lauderdale song that I could think of, and they would pass on them all, and they go, no, I just kind of want those ones that Straight likes. Well, it's interesting, it's down the road, Straight ended up recording like five or six of those songs after they didn't. And I think the same thing happened with Dean Dillon, and, and Dean Dillon was, I mean, or Straight was smart enough and savvy enough that he got Dean, and he got, you know, Hey, this is a great songwriter and I can make this mine. Um, so that so that he could translate it. He could hear, he could hear through what Dean did and what Lauderdale did and make these records his own. Because they're succinctly, you know, George Strait and or distinctly George Strait when you hear them on records. I mean, case in point, I, I used to go when I first started in this business and I would go back to Texas every once in a while. And I, and people try to, you know, ask me what I was doing. I was, telling, I was pitching songs. We'd gotten a couple of George Strait songs and people would say, no, he writes all his own songs. And I wouldn't, you know, I mean, that wasn't true at the time, but what it did show me is like my straight didn't seem like a fish out of water singing somebody else's strong songs. And, and, um, but all that to say is, is um, at the same time, people would say, well, look at Straits having all these hits with Dean Dillon. I want to hear Dean Dillon songs and they wouldn't get them. And then Straight would hear the same songs down the road. So so that's always a deal. Like like um, no matter what, some, what somebody's hearing and how it translates and how they're able to hear it, if there's no vision or or they just can't just get past somebody singing. Um, I, I have noticed as well that in the past, there's a lot of people um, that um, uh, like uh, pitching songs for girls, a handful of girls. I could I could get a lot further down the road with a, a male demo than a female demo, you know, especially, you know, when I was at Blue Water, I had Trisha Yearwood singing on some old demos. And 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 uh, that was a struggle to get those cut. And a lot of times I could tell that, man, you know, she's just such a badass singer. But for you know, once again, 2021, it's harder to get songs recorded. There's there's not outside, there's not a lot of outside pitches, or not a lot of people recording those songs. Um, and yeah, you do hear the comments sometimes. Well, I don't want to record that. Brent just had it out. So sometimes we're walking around music row and we think everybody's heard it and they haven't. If you have an artist you just talked about with George Strait and another artist from the hat pack and that late eighties, early nineties. And then he became the biggest selling country all around artists of all time. And Garth Brooks, these two gentlemen made a living off of other people's songs. They made a yeah. huge living off it. So why would the mentality change? Is it because there's no record sales anymore? Is it because all the money's made in touring and that they get a hit, they want to get that publishing right too to make more revenue? Or is it ego saying, I have to only record the songs that I pin, even though it's a co-write with four, sometimes four or five other people, like the song Cruise that Chase Rice was a writer on. It had like four or five writers on for Florida Georgia Line. I understand the song becomes a mammoth hit. And they make some money on it. But is it ego that doesn't allow these artists to get past the point of like, dude, if Garth Brooks can sing a song called Rodeo that he didn't write and make it what it was, why can't we do it today? And he's probably the wealthiest artist around, too. Um, you know, I I don't know a lot of people now. Um, I mean, a lot of these artists. And, and I, I believe that, you know, whether or not it's ego, maybe some of it is ego. Um, I also feel a little bit like, you know, it, it's become, well, obviously now we have TikTok, but it kind of went, it used to be that a record company would discover just a com the rawest artist you've ever seen and say, how do we get this guy going? Then maybe go find him a publishing deal or hook him up with a writer or try finding songs and start developing. And then that landed over in the publisher's corner. You know what I mean? So so like that, that job kind of went away from the record company, the real early on development. And became the job of the publisher. Well, a publisher that signs a writer is uh, that's an, a, a young artist is going to want them to record 
all their own songs or as many as possible and perhaps write with their their own um, uh, their other writers that they have in house. So it becomes like an entity that has to make money. And I don't know how it feeds itself. Um, uh, um, and, and some of these, some of the guys that write all their own songs are great writers. I, I, I just, I, I do wonder that I'm, I'm hopeful because I just, I think just cause you write a bunch of average songs doesn't mean again, you're Willie Nelson or Bob Dylan or Dean Dylan or Paul Overstreet or Don Schlitz. And again, you know, look how, I mean, I don't know how much money Garth Brooks is worth. He and Randy Travis and look at the, by the way, Randy Travis written some good songs and Garth's written some good songs, but I don't think Garth Brooks is bank account is suffering because he recorded other people's songs. Um, um, and, and, and I, I just don't know. Um, I don't know if it gets to the place where, where maybe it's just, that's where the pendulum is right now. And, and it, it takes somebody to come out, to have a record full of some songs that they've written and, 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 and then have some songs that some other people have written that had no agenda behind them whatsoever. You know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't I'm not a uh, I don't know the chronological history of our business very well, but I, I do know that a lot of stories. And I, I know Willie came here and, and and he tried to make his artist a long time. And he did write crazy and probably some others that have become standard since then. But his first hit and, and, and I would challenge him. I would say that Willie Nelson is one of the great American songwriters of the 20th century. I mean, literally, I mean, one of the greatest. I mean, he's just and he, he's like that. He's like Jack Daniels on your hat. You can go to some room, um, you know, you know, remote bar in Italy and they're going to have a bottle of Jack Daniels and somebody in there says, what are you doing country music? You know, you can mention all the biggest artists in the world. They'll say, well, I don't know them, but I know Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash, you know? So, so here's somebody who's one of the greatest American um, poets, artists, singers of all time. And his first hit, and I don't know where it went. I think it went number one. I may be wrong was blue eyes crying in the rain which was a song that was written by Fred Rose in at least, I mean, maybe somebody else. So all I'd say is you're looking at a guy whose career as an artist finally got a foothold because of a song that somebody else wrote, yet he's one of the greatest American songwriters ever. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't kid myself. I don't sit around and think what needs to get back to that. I don't live in the past. But I would hope one day that, you know, and generally across the, the uh the board that songs just got really important. What um, you said that you came to Nashville from Houston, Frank Liddell as a song plugger. Is there a full-time position in that office you sit in right now at Carnival Music on Music Row as a song plugger? How do these songs get in front of an artist that all of your writers are writing? Is that a fair question? That's a fair, very fair question. It's a good question. It's one that I struggle with. And I, and I, I was a song player. I never was really good. I had some luck and I had some good writers, you know, and, and I, and I got a little bit of a reputation for having interesting songs and having an ear for songs, perhaps it has helped me a lot. And even when I make records now, all these years later, I'm very much a, um, a very much look at, um, I, 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 every time I'm making a record, I want to start with a song. And when I haven't, I've regretted it. So, um, so I am a song person. I never was a great song plugger. I think song pluggers now are a lot of them and, and, and some of them know good songs, but a lot of them are, are keeping schedules. A lot of them are going like, man, Hey, we're, we're, you know, my, this person, this is my writer. We need to get him in with these people because they're having success. It's pairing people up with teams that are having success, getting them in with, with artists that are writing their own things. It's a lot less, hey, I want to make you a song, a, a tape, or, or, you know, which was, was for me, but a CD or, 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 or send you an MP3 of a song to consider recording. I, I think that, that, that some people still record outside songs, but it, I, I bet if you go look at the top, 20 albums right now if they exist on the country charts i bet there's 10 five songs at the most in all of those that were quote unquote outside songs so their job is you know hopefully to teach a song player's job now is hopefully teach your songwriter you know to coach him to write better and better and better and also get them in the right rooms to help them to have success 
um, it it's it doesn't always seem like um, it it's not necessarily conducive with with you know putting the two best or two people in a room together that may write the best song ever written. But I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. I think a lot of it is done like in in teams and 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 having some power. Um, you go look at again. I mentioned Bernie Taupin and Elton John. You know that there's a reason for that. And 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 you go look, ask about Paul Overstreet and Don Schlitz. Well, what do they write? Go look at it. it you, you don't have to say how many awards they won or or what you know how many number one hits they had. You start saying forever and ever, amen. Or on the other hand, you know, you start mentioning the songs and. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, back then when they would write a song, song plugger or, you know, would take it to the producer, the A&R person, maybe the artist, and they would need a great song. Hopefully it would get recorded. So you have been in the business, but you also, to me, and talking with you and meeting you and being around you, you have a, what I would call an eye for talent. Now, everybody can say those words, but it's very difficult, in my opinion, to have this this talent of having an eye for talent. So take me through the process in your history, Frank Liddell of how do you choose or <clears throat> excuse me, how do you approve of the writers that are on your portfolio at carnival? And then I want you to go in to the 1995, 96 time frame of your career as a record producer and a song plugger and a publishing guy. What did you see in Chris Knight that made you go, wait a minute, even though you probably, you know, you're, you're a great songwriter, but you got to be singing these songs. You're an artist too. Because to me, like that was a big move for somebody because Chris Knight did not want to be an artist. If you know, probably if I had to guess, I don't know that for sure, but I for sure know that he doesn't play the Nashville game today. But what did you see? How do you approve these songwriters? How did you approve well, Chris Knight to go into saying, I'm going to take a risk on producing this guy's record and make him a star. Um, I, you know, that, First of all, as I said earlier, you know, I, I love Bob Dylan as a kid. And then I also love um, um, Neil Young. And and uh, and I think they're both great singers. I'm not saying that they have, you know, Beverly Sills' voice, but I do think they're great singers. And and I and and so when I heard Chris, I always heard him as an artist and and uh, I never heard him. And I also. I felt like that there needed to be some writer and artist development there. And I'm awful, especially at the artist development, but I thought he needed to grow as a writer. And I, and I tried to help him get with some other people that I didn't think would, would bastardize what he was trying to do. I mean, I, 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 I avoided putting in with people that would say, Oh, well, if you want to get this song recorded, if you want to hit, you can't say this or you have to do that. I was trying to put him together with, people that were great writers and hopefully he could learn the craft of, of writing better. I've always believed that, you know, like you, any, I'm not saying anybody can learn craft and some people are just genius at it and some people are good at it and some people aren't good at it, but I'm always more intrigued with somebody that had a heart and, 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 uh, and then man, then, and then the craft came later and, you know, that makes sense. In other words, like, because they already, it's what they're saying, how they're saying it's so unique and so interesting that they can learn how to dot the I's and cross the T's in time. But that doesn't, that doesn't predetermine what they're going to write. And, and um, the case in point on Chris, I remember the first time I, uh, I ever uh, saw Chris, it, there was a night where people could go to the Bluebird, I guess, play two songs. And a friend of mine from Texas, a guy named Ace Ford, who's a great writer, was was in town and he was playing that night. And he asked me to come out there and hear him play. And Chris went on right before him, and he played "If I Were You" in a song, and, and, and which in, in a song called "Ruby." And 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 I talked to him that night, and and that's when I kind of started my working relationship with Chris. And and it moved the shit out of me. If I could feel that way, man, those, you know, you're asking me how you find somebody, what I'm thinking, man, it just moved me. It moved me. It was just exciting. It was like, damn, what the hell is that? It's like one of the coolest things I've ever heard in my life. 
Well, If I Were You is a great song. And and uh, do you know that song by chance? Okay, so you know that song. So I don't know did, if you ever put Ruby on a record. But but this is interesting. So, but Ruby was an up-tempo song, kind of in the vein of like a guitar town, but a little quicker the way Chris, Chris's groove would work. And and it and it's just, it was a, it was an up-tempo song, and it probably had like six verses, probably six and a half minutes long. And and so those were things where I felt like, well, golly, you know, if he. Um, Man, this could be more succinct and shorter. And if it changed here, if it went somewhere, um, I, I, I thought that that he could certainly learn how to be more succinct and and learn how to. I hate the word polish, by the way. I mean, I I don't really know the right words here, but but if I could just be a little bit more like, you know, box it up. And what you're trying to do, so it punches you in the face and doesn't drag on, you know. Now, funny thing about that song, I remember being in my office and I said, I said, um, uh, I think I kind of told him, I said, well, you know, this song is really long and all that. And I remember saying, you know, if if if, if this was a true story, you know, I wouldn't tell you to change it. But but, you know, it's just a story song about this dude running from the law all over the country, you know. And and I just think it needs to be short. And he said, well, it is a true story. It's about my grandfather, you know. So so looking back, there are some times where I wanted to Chris to carve more. And I I don't and and I don't even know what that means. And and looking back, I don't know if I was right, you know. I just don't. Um there were a few things that I asked him to change. And one of them I think I was right for sure. It's funny how I remember him all these years. And one of them I think I was dead wrong. It still kind of bothers me. But but I will tell you that that I've hooked him up. There, there was a songwriter team, Sam and Annie Tate, and they were from California and they're just kind of folk writers. And I just thought, man, these guys are great writers and they're crazy, dear friends, but crazy. And and they were um I, I they wrote kind of folk songs and like like almost just right out of the 60s or something and but they never wasted a word never wasted a word never you know, there wasn't just a filler verse or a filler line anywhere in their song and so i put them together with chris to write and i and i know um that that they wrote some good songs together they wrote summer 75 together I don't think it was right for for Chris long term as an artist, um, but I do remember when you know that one of the reasons I put them together is because every song they turned in was just airtight and not not in a bullshit way in a in a friggin' a po a sixties kind of flower child poet way and I love that stuff anyway. But they they didn't know the game enough to change him and say, well, this is what you need to do if you want to make it, or this is what you need to do. And and I remember after that, Chris went away and he came back and and, and he had been in, in home in slaughters for a little while. And he came back with two songs he wrote by himself and they were framed and a song called Send a Boat. And and, and which I just think is just this day one of the greatest songs I've ever fucking heard. And it's polished. It, it's correct. It's not polished. It's just. You know, I, I can see a little bit like he did become, you know, he was becoming a songwriter. And and uh, it's not to take away from the earlier things he wrote either. I'm just saying that that, um, you know, he needed um, he needed some development. But I can't I, I can't I'm, rarely do I ever hear heart like that in a writer, you know, in the truth. Ugh. Um there, there, the real quick, the regret I have is that, and, and if I were you, the line about the guy, he says, he says, he says, yes, sir, this thing is, he, he said, yes, sir, this thing is real, and I have the hammer back. Well, real, it needed to be a two-syllable word to me, and, and, and I just realized that, that in Western Kentucky, real is a two-syllable word, and I had him change it to loaded, and, and, and I think that's, I don't know what he says now, but I, I sort of, I, I, I I've always thought that he's the most honest songwriter I've ever known in my life. There's nobody that's come close to it. And, and, uh, and, um, and so, I mean, it's in the scheme of things, you know, I hope he doesn't wake up in the middle of the night and want to come get me for that. But, 
but all I'd say is I, I do, you know, there was, he was already a great songwriter and I didn't want to change him. I just wa- wanted him to get better and I didn't really know how to do it. On his newest record, Almost Daylight, he has a cut on there called, that he wrote called Send It On Down. Your wife, Leanne, sings yeah. vocals on it. She also cut the song. When I hear the second verse of this song, the first verse is magic, but the second verse about sitting in the bleachers of the football field, Sunday morning, it's cold. He just polished off a fifth. He can almost hear the good people sing because the church is closed. When that happens, and I picture this man in those bleachers down on his luck, and he, and he's comparing himself to these good people that are in church, you know, praising Jesus above. When I hear that, I'm just like, whole, are you the same way when you hear this song? And is that why Leanne cuts it? Because you and her look at or you and her look at each other and be like, are you kidding me on how touching this sh- this song is? Hey Amen. He doesn't make it up you know what i mean it's not a story and i love storytelling but it's it's he he, he knows it he sees it man you know and he and it's it's and the, you know the way he says it it i mean i have goosebumps right now just thinking about it that that he didn't make put a bunch of clever words together he told something that you've heard that that he's seen that he knows and and he knows chris is an interesting guy man he grew up in a really in in rural kentucky and i remember a little bit when i was working on like the dot-com business things were blowing up and and but that didn't hit rural kentucky and and there was a lot of times where his songs were dark and everybody kind of want to hear light this and that and the other and 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 one time Chris said, you know, the reality is, is these songs, there is light in them because everybody I know that's in these songs that have grown up with, they have overcome. They're overcoming. This is where they are. And the fact that they survive and end up okay is the light in all these songs. And, and that's just fucking genius to me. You know, he's never been compromised by how I got to fix this to make it work here or work there, you know? And I, 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 I think to this day, he's got to be one of the most underrated songwriters I've ever heard in my life. You know, do you personally not like the fact that somebody like the man we're talking about from Slaughter, Kentucky, does not become a star that the whole world knows about and needs to hear. But some of the people that are on the radio do, and they're not what you called authentic and real and and just you know like maybe polish isn't the right word. Chris, Chris isn't polished. Chris is Chris, right? Like, does it piss you off personally, Frank, when you see a career go that way to where you know he should have been the at least winning the Songwriter of the Year award several times in his career? You know, yeah, it 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 it, it it's different, and it, and it's changed over the years because it's not the only time it's ever happened, but it hurts, and and I wonder, and and I and um, you know, before we made the first Chris Knight record, my old boss who I mentioned, Brownlee Ferguson, he said, "Hey, remember, you know, when you're making this record, your name goes on Chris's name goes on it big on the front." And yours goes little bitty on the back. And if you make a bad record, you can rebound from it easily and go make another one, but it's going to really hurt him. And so, so I've always taken these things personally, you know, like, like Chris, his well being, what he could become, all those things were really, really, really personal to me. And it meant, and, and he and his, and his, the, who he is as a human being meant, a lot to me and 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 i you know and i loved him and i still love him and 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 so um i i don't think that i that even i was perfect and i mean i think that i did um, had some missteps as well but it's not it didn't hurt that man my whole thing was at the time and this didn't exist but i knew it could happen i saw it happen with leanne i saw it happen with miranda casey musgraves and guys it's like Man, this guy, this is what country radio should be. You know, that was my feeling about it. And 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 it doesn't, I don't mean through and through, and I don't mean that he needs to be spun four times an hour, but I thought, you know, um, this guy has some songs, and if he can have some top 20 songs, he's gonna sell a lot of records, he's gonna have a career. And back then, it was all or nothing. Now, later on, some people like 
again, my wife, I just mentioned Casey, my wife, Miranda, Eric Church, these people, they broke with the help of radio, but they didn't have to have number one singles. Back then, it was sort of all or nothing, you know, and, and most of the songs that only got to 20 were just bad attempts at trying to get to number one that died, that didn't make it. And you didn't have like like some songs with some teeth that could make a lot of noise. And I I don't know what I envisioned his career to be like. I envisioned it to be him to be accepted and um, uh, way more and and sell more records. Uh, and and um, uh, you know I I I wanted more for him. What I really don't know is. Did I really want more for myself? And I just don't know the answer to that. I I know that at the time I thought I had Chris's best interest at heart, but maybe it was who I thought Chris should be, and maybe he's done just fine. Yeah, I I think it's a hard parallel, right? Like you weren't running his every day, right? You weren't. Are you managing no, him? There, like no. he. I'm not. And, 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 and I think there were circumstances, you know, and, and um, that, that dictated a lot of what happened, but he did trust me. And, you know, when I first met Chris, I was, man, like I said, I was in awe of him. And it's amazing how much he knew and how much he didn't know. And I didn't know shit, but man, I thought, man, this is fun. And I didn't know how to do what to do. And, or, you know, I didn't know what to do and I didn't know how to do anything I needed to do. And it took me so long to figure it out. I just didn't want to ruin it, you know, started doing more guitar vocals with him, et cetera, you know. But I also, I, I think that I just told Chris, you know, he's a coal mine reclamation inspector. So, uh, you, you know, you know, the, the John Prime song Paradise. Well, well, Lord won't take you to, to Muhlenberg County, you know, by by the Green River where Paradise Lake. You know, I'm sorry, Mr. P. Well, I'm sorry, my can't remember though. You're too too late in asking me, Mr. Peabody's coal trucks don't haul it away. Well, one county over is Webster County, and that's where Chris grew up. And Chris was a coal mine and reclamation inspector, and and you know, it wasn't going down into the ground and getting coal. It was stripping land and pulling coal off the top. It was strip mining where he's from. And you had a history of people just tearing that land up and destroying it and then turning around and and giving it back. Say, hey, we're done here. You know, they, we're paying for it, but it obviously wasn't worth it and just turn this land back over. So at some point in time, Chris is a coal mine reclamation inspector and he is making sure that when these people that have afforded Everybody in Western Kentucky, an opportunity to live and maybe put a little coin in their pocket. He's also saying, you're not going to, you're going to put our land back the way you found it. And I know stories, I know he spent the night in trees, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, it, it meant a lot to him. And so, you know, you're looking at a guy who is not in the least bit sentimental. He's not in the least bit, well, he probably is, but he's not going to admit it. But but he has a powerful point of view, and he, and he comes from something that means a lot. And I could tell this early on. So I, I just said, I'm not going to sign you. I'm going to just pay you to come to Nashville. Like when you come up here, just give me your gas receipts and all that, and I'll work with you. You know, and 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 that's how we started working together. Uh, um, you know, he would just drive up, and I may have taken him to this Bill Hollich house. Was a, had a great studio guitar player, and we would do some guitar vocals. And I was always thinking, trying to figure out what to do and how to do something. You know, but also didn't want to screw it up. So I think that he had a few more years to become you know, uh, um, uh, to get his um, um, his pension with the state. So I didn't want to just BS him into coming to Nashville and, and then all of a sudden it not work out. So there was always in the back of my mind that I had this such a high regard for who he was and and respect for him. You know, at the same time, now I listened to a lot of rock and roll going up, uh, growing up, and, and I like you know foreigner. Um, um, I'm just trying to think. And I was in 
you know, grade school and high school and things like that. And, 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 and I, I like to have a lot of fun. And there was a lot of Chris remind me of John Prine, Ronnie, and all those things that, that I thought, this is great. This is going to be fun. I never thought how to do what to do with it. And, and, and I, and so in retrospect, I wasn't his manager that came later, uh, but he did sign with our record company and I tried to go to war for him within the building. Maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe we made the wrong record. I know there's some some element of him that probably believes that. And 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 uh and um um you know again I didn't know what to do. I didn't have answers. Like so when he put his career in in my hands, and he had this guy that's 27 years old who moved up here from Texas, who thought, man, it's some fun shit. Let's go do this. I, all I cared about, I didn't know anything. I just thought this is some great shit and we need to, we, we need to protect it and have fun with it. So um, I, I, although my motives, I thought, you know, were good. I don't necessarily, I mean, maybe some of it was through my own lens. Maybe it wasn't perfect. You know, maybe he should have just, gone and made singer songwriter records and never try to go down that road i don't know i don't either but i do know that I don't he's regret it. you don't no you, i don't regret you, you broke you broke you broke up i do i want to make sure you said that you no, don't regret I, it yeah i do not regret it and i'll tell you that if you look at it man the world there wasn't really much americana the world wasn't full of people playing making you know, quote unquote, Americana records. I don't want to get on that road because that's a whole nother deal, but it wasn't, it was, it, man, there was nothing out there like Chris. It wasn't, there, there wasn't a friendly home anywhere. There wasn't like a thing to do. And, 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 and I, like when we made the record, I mean, I had some, I didn't have that your, your average Nashville musician. I mean, not, none of them are average. That's, I, I meant the record, the musicians that were playing on every record, I carefully selected some of the greatest musicians and engineer and people that I could think of, man. And we went there and tried to make the best damn record we could, you know, and, it, and, and, and is uh, part of you trying to tell me, Frank Liddell, that you don't think that that 1997 self-titled Chris Knight album is not perfect. Are you trying to tell me that you have some regrets on that album? Cause uh, I, I think it's I, one of the greatest. I can't have any regrets. The only, I love it. And, and I've, and I've always think people, I hope that in in somebody's life in this business, that one time they can care enough about music and put in put into something what I put into that because I thought, man, I I never accepted no for an answer. And I remember when we finished tracking that record, I was just sitting on the board and I had tears in my eyes. It was the most exhausting thing. It was three years or four years of just trying to find a way just to get this guy a record out, you know? So I don't regret. I think if I do have a regret, it's that I, I didn't feel like at the time that maybe I left him behind, you know, a little bit with all the guitar players. I didn't have, I didn't, it wasn't thought that way. I can't explain it, you know? I think it's a wonderful record and I think it's done him well. And it's, and, and, and look, man, people still call me about that. Dance. It's amazing. I mean, we made it 20 something years ago and young people here go, oh, let's go do their Chris Knight record. You know, so I don't have any regrets, and, and I, I doubt he does either for the most part. I do think that maybe that was, I believe that he was going to have a bigger career. And I believe that, as a recording artist, you know, and, 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 I, and, and I just don't know if I left him behind and, and let him down. I don't think that I ever thought like, Hey dude, you need to do what I'm telling you to do. I thought my thought process the whole time was this is Chris Knight and nobody's doing what we're doing. So it wasn't, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, uh, I don't personally regret the record. I can, I can, see why maybe you know it doesn't resonate is and i don't know we don't talk about this but that it maybe doesn't resonate with him the way it does with some others you know when was the last time you personally listened to it it's been a long time why does it does it touch you in a way to where it brings up a part of frank liddell that you don't want to go back there or are you proud of it because i listen to it at least once a month but i listen to songs on it every day no, you know what? Um, I will tell you this. I um, when I think about my 
what I've been able to do, I think that that is, man, maybe I should have stopped there. <laughs> I, I, it's one of my favorite things I've ever been a part of in my life, business or otherwise, you know, so absolutely. And I could listen to it, by the way, I could listen to it a heartbeat. I just don't listen to much that I've worked on in the past, but it holds a really special place. You know, while we were making those records that, um, you know, ultimately the trailer tapes came out and and my whole thing was, I thought he was going to be bigger than he was. And I was like, I wanted to get these songs recorded where he wrote them in this trailer that he lived in, you know, and 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 uh and so that's kind of the, was the impetus of that. What's interesting is that I would have never had the balls to call them the trailer tapes to his face, but ultimately they just became the trailer tapes, and that's what he, they're known as, you know. Right and and when um you know years later uh, Ray Kennedy um you know Rick's manager Rick Alter got Ray Kennedy involved, and 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 I was a too close to them and b too far away to make sense of what they had been. So gave him to Ray Kennedy, who's just a wonderful uh, singer, songwriter, producer, engineer, fascinating guy, made Chris nice last record. Um, so, so I gave them to him or, or it was Rick's idea that, and, and he made sense of them all because there was different, different versions of, of the songs recorded in different places. Well, the funniest thing about it was that, that, and it, a lot of water had gone on the bridge, you know, since we had made the trailer tapes. And this guy interviewed me about it. And then he interviewed Chris about it or vice versa. And, and on the when the CD was released, it has a quote from Chris and a quote from me. And Chris's was essential or mine was essentially. Man, I hope I, I, I'm so I, I'm so glad these things are finally coming out. I've always held out hope that these things would be heard. And Chris's quote was essentially, yeah, I was hoping these things would never come out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a little bit of me sometimes, man. Again, you know, I'd gone to boarding school. I mean, and 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 if you knew some of the people I went to boarding school with, they're not they're not in the country music business, you know. And wonderful people, I saw dear friends all over the place, but I I never wanted to be the person that felt like I was exploiting Chris. I always look up to him. I thought he was fascinating and thought it was interesting getting outside of the scope of boarding school and being a fraternity in college and all that to, to, to realize that there's people all over America who are smarter than me, better looking than me that have so many things going on and, 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 and just interesting things to say that that it was a real moment in my life during that time where I was realizing, man, I was just lucky to have been afforded the education uh, um, uh, I was because I could never do what Chris did and so many other people that I've met in this business. But I, I just always would hope that I was never, I never was trying to exploit him. I just, I thought, I thought and still think He's one of the greatest songwriters ever walked the face of the earth. Certainly the most underrated, if you ask me. And 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 the most honest. I was hoping he would see his day in the sun. You know? I couldn't say it better. In today's world, in this conversation, you've mentioned many artists that, in my opinion, have a legacy. They stand the test of time. Their songs, their albums, their presence in the heart of music lovers. I yeah. gr- I grew up, I was born in the 70s, and I grew up with a mom and dad that brought me up on the right music, in my opinion. We listened to Waylon and Willie and Don Williams and, and Johnny and Elvis. Yeah. And, and I mean, just a huge diversity of rock and roll and pure Prairie League. And then it was, and then I got in a little bit of the, the 80s rock. And then I got into Vince Gill. And then I got into Tritt. And I got into Chestnut. And I got into Tracy Lawrence. And I got into Garth a little bit. Um I'm going to say something, and, and you might not even be able to comment on this, Frank, <clears throat> but I don't feel that a majority of today's artists in traditional country music, country radio, yeah. whatever that is, however you freaking divine country radio now, I don't think that we're going to be listening to their songs 20 years from now. And I know that that sounds like who the hell is this guy to say that, but I can put on Don Williams right now and listen to his entire library. And it was from 40 years ago. I don't know if a lot of the music coming out of music city USA today is going to stand the test of time like that. Is that, 
arrogant to say or stupid to say, or, or can you even it's reply not, to that? It's not arrogant because you're a consumer. You know, um, I, my feeling about that is that I don't think in terms of, um, I, you know, every person I've ever seen come through this town, they've seen their day in the sun and then it, it fades away. And I've never wanted to be the old guy that said, oh, man, oh, these kids, blah, they, man, they, they don't know. They, you know, they don't know what they're doing. They're not making, they're making shit or whatever it is, man. So what is probably kind of hard for you to believe. I, just, I don't listen to a ton of it um, and I don't begrudge anybody. And I, and I know some of these people that write some of these songs or they're, I see them out and I love everybody. I'm in a place in my life where I can sort of, I mean, within reason, do whatever I want. I don't have a desire to stay, stay relevant. I mean, I, my, I have a burning desire to find people not, I don't, and I don't want to ever live in the past, but that are songwriters who write work music that's expressive of who they are as people and hope to help to find them to find their day in the sun. And, and, I don't look at, I don't, so I don't look at it as, well, these guys are writing shit, man. And I don't, and, 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 and it's not like good old days when there are great songs out there. I just am really focused now on having to not live. I'm trying to not live in the past, but to find the, the true American great singer songwriters and, and, and having them, hopefully see their day in the sun in a, in an environment where that's seemingly more and more difficult. You know, um, I can't, you know, I, I, um, I have met people in my life that have told her records I've worked on. They've told me that they suck and that I suck and it, you know, uh, and, and so I, again, I just don't, and, and people were pissed and bitter and I don't want to be the person that sits there and says, um, um, oh, man, well, look, all they're doing is shit now. And that's and I ain't going to be a part of that. But what I do hope to do is. Have some more victories that for the right reason and hopefully give some opportunities and be a part of some teams, some people that nobody thinks whatever make it and and just put our heads down and go hopefully see some people careers through to where they can see the light of day to some degree some be varying degree somebody may just have a good singer songwriter tour maybe somebody breaks wide open as an artist do you the rest is boring if you came to me and said you know let me look at some of the songs that i've been a part of i mean traveling soldier you know anything but mine angry all the time um um, I hope you dance. The house uh, uh, built me, you know, um, I may hate myself in the morning or, or never getting in the fool. A lot of things that I've just somehow been had in my career that fucking, that motivates me. I don't, I have zero idea of any stat about my career. None. I don't know how many number ones carnival had. I don't know how many number ones I produced. Not many. I don't know how many records I've been a part of. So, but but somebody coming up to me and saying, man, I heard this song that was yours or whatever, you know, man, that damn, I want more of that. I do too. Do you ever find yourself, and you're young, you've been in the game a long time, but you're still young. Do you find yourself getting tired of it ever? I know you just said that you'd love to be motivated, but do you still enjoy a live yeah, show? Do you like live music still? Do you make a well, do you make an effort to go out and you and Leanne go see are, a concert? Those are two different questions, man. And I will tell you that 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 um um okay yeah I am tired of a lot of things. I'm not tired, and and. My wife said it the best, man. When you know, a couple of years ago, she just said, "Look, you know, I'm like, I, I, I look, I don't begrudge country radio for not playing me." She said, she "said I want to get out of the sandbox." Meaning, I'm a grown woman. I want to go do whatever the hell I want. I'm not going to go play in the young person's game. I want out of the sand pile. And 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 I thought that was brave and in a in a brilliant way of articulating it. And 
I've gotten that way too, you know, and I, and, and it's like, I don't, um, again, I'm, I'm tired. Like I said, I can name you songs that, that I've been a part of my career. I, I don't want to have to start saying numbers. Well, we had three number ones last year, but they were all five way rights. I want to be, I just want to go put our head, my head down and do what I've always done, but do it better and, and, and learn from all the mistakes we've made, you know? So I'm, I'm tired of a lot of this shit and I don't blame me. I'm not mad at anybody. I mean, I can't change the course of, you know, you know, of how things go. Um, but uh, but part of my goal is to, in, in current goal is to figure out how to way to to continue because I'm energetic as hell about how do I go f- make a record or find somebody that nobody's heard before that sort of thing. The live music element is funny. You asked. I realized one day I've just never been a huge live music fan, and I love live music because I like to go with other people. But I spent. I fell in love with music listening to records by myself. And that's the way I look at everything. And it's probably bass backwards too, you know, that I'm looking at an artist and and I'm like, I don't give a shit what you do live. Your manager will figure that shit out. Let's just go make a great record. So. Well, where does it go from here, Frank? I know that we're going to do another, have another conversation down the road, but where, where does it go from here? What, what, do you spend your time doing now? You keep saying these words. I'm motivated to find the great singer song or the great songwriter. I want a great song. I want to make it. I want a good record. Where does it go from here for you right now? Are you actively seeking this when you get in your car and leave your house? Are you actively seeking this in Nashville on a daily basis? Or are you to the point to where it comes to you now? Um, everything that I've ever been a part of in my life that that was succeeded or failed, or something that I loved, I discovered or found in in differently. So I, I I'm very very skeptical of and 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 by the way, you know Bruce Robinson's our first writer. The first time he ever sent me a tape, which was back in 1991 or two, it was almost. Man, like like the way it was presented was this person might need to be locked up. And it, and 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 I don't think I would have listened to it if it was presented to me any more professionally. So I'm always I, I'm not looking my I don't I, I've tried to work with people that are already working with people as a producer with teams of people. That's just never worked one time for me. Um, I'm working on developing a few things. I hate those terms. There's a lot when I was working for Chris, with Chris for a long time, like I just before we ever put that record out or did anything like people didn't understand it. This town was so much different and I hated explaining myself. So I have things I'm working on a, 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 um, a record with Leanne and and with, which I love. And I, and I do have a worry. I think it may be two records and 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 instead of one longer, I think it may be the beginning of two records. And, 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 and I and I got a run that through uh with city hall city hall being leanne so um um but there's a handful of things i'm working on early on that i'm really excited about that nobody knows and they're not people that have managers or agents that people are are looking at you know or for that that they're the golden child they're things that i think that i can put my head down and do something really special and interesting and 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 I'm hoping, you know, I hate talking about them. I hate telling everybody that these people are going to be great. I just kind of want to put my head down. But also look at somehow like, you know, this Carnival is a publishing company. We just never really got into the, as I said earlier, the quote unquote bro country element of music. And 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 we don't have any track guys that write for us. We just all have melodists and lyricists, and they all pretty much are singer songwriters. Some more mainstream than others, and, a, and an odd variety of them. Um, and and but one of the interesting thing is is I, I think that I've been working with Cobb now as a producer. I mean, I'm sorry, as a as a publisher for 12 years, and 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 uh and we had a meeting the other day just talking about where to go from here and all that. And all that interesting stuff, you know, the, all surviving a lot of the things I've been talking about with, um, um, with 
you know, the the five way rides, the, the 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 radio just being a little bit more like everything's sort of similar. That I, I feel a little bit like everybody knows Brent. He's paid a lot of dues. He's he's kicking ass, and I feel like we're just getting to a place where he's going to see his day in the sun, and and for the right reasons too. And, and a he's going to see his day in the sun as a writer, and hopefully an artist. And, and, and B, it's going to be shit you're going to want to hear, you know, and it's going to be hopefully which outside songs that he has recorded. I'm hopeful that they are that they change people's careers change, and, 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 and that will have been something that that ties us back to the old days of recording great songs to the future of hopefully recording great songs. And I use him as maybe the bellwether of helping this con- company because we got a couple of young people here. They're young artists. I'm really excited about, and and but they're all of similar cloth. And I'm hoping maybe he maybe he's poised to to lead us through or out of the doldrums of what we've been dealing. with. He's the with. best songwriter in Nashville right now. I'm going to tell you that right now, Frank Liddell. Oh, he's awesome, man. And 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 uh, it's funny because I was talking to. My assistant, who um, or, or uh, one of them lives in Atlanta, it's kind of a long story, but but she saw my calendar that I was meeting with Brent. She said, "What are y'all talking about?" I just kind of told her. She goes, "She said, I love Brent." She said, "You tell Brent when you see him that every time you know people turn our songs into him." She said, "Every time I get a song from him, I smile and I can't wait to hear it." And I think oh. that we've all felt that way for a long time, and I'm hoping you know that that again, the whole world hasn't changed the. You know, maybe what's popular right now is a little bit different, but I think if the song still matters, and I think it does, that that Brett Cobb's going to be a household name, hopefully sooner than later. I f- I will fly to Nashville and celebrate with you the day it happens. I've been I couldn't say that more vividly myself. My last question to you, Mister Frank Liddell, and thank you so much for spending almost two hours of your day with me, but. Chris Stapleton has a song on a newer album called Nashville comma TN. It's about a love romance marriage with music city. The yeah. gi- I'm sure you've heard it. And the gist of the song is that we're breaking up and I'm leaving because you built me up, but you've also tore down everything that made me you've tore down my dreams and the things that helped me become a dreamer and the things that helped me become who I am. It's time for me to move on. I'll probably always think of you like a girl, like he's talking to a girl in the song. Yeah. Great song. We'll never yeah. get any radio play. But yeah. do you, my question to you to end our talk today, Frank, and we'll schedule part two because I love your life. Um, do you still love your city, Nashville, Tennessee? Do you wake up and say, I got to get out of here too? I've heard rumors that even he might be leaving. Chris Knight left. Justin Moore took off. People leave that place. I know that a lot of people stay, but do you still love driving into music row 16th and 17th Avenue where carnival music sits. Do you still love your city? Well, uh, um, I will say this. Now the city itself has changed a lot. And, and, and so, uh, you know, um, do I want to go downtown tonight? Probably not. But as far as music city, I, you know, music cities cannot be to blame for the things I've not liked. Like if somebody says, well, country music is really shitty right now. Man, I have never been here for 10 minutes when people have not said this is country, the shittiest country music's ever been. And people will point out that there's been shitty country music in the 60s and 70s and, and all the great years were not so great. So, um, you know, what's interesting is we get flagged for it a lot. Pop music is such a giant field that you can there, there are more names to pull from over the last 50 years. That you know that you know there's just you know if there's X amount of artists in 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 a country there's a hundred fold what more than that times as many artists in pop so there's more you know household names more George Joneses more Willie Nelson more Leanne's or Miranda there but 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 there's also even way more shitty music. So I've never, you know, it's just a numbers thing. I've never, uh, you know, our, our format or genre, I would like to say, or, and I would like to say that it was an art form and we'll get back to that, but I'm never, I, I don't subscribe to the thought process that, you know, Nashville sucks. 
what I struggle personally with is I always like to do things, whatever I'm going to do. I like to find things or work with things that wouldn't otherwise have representation. And, and, uh, and I find myself more and more having to put my head down and not listening to conventional wisdom and outside, you know, advice from within this city. So, so I, I can't, if I have a new artist I'm working with, I, I don't find myself walking up down Music Row asking people's opinions. However, the people whose opinions that I care most about in the world all happen to be here too. So in other words, the more things change, the more things stay the same. And um, I, I, I will say this to you about like that song at Christmas. That one of the things I've said to people over the years is they they come here and they're trying to impress people in Music Road. And I understand. Um, and 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 when people say, like, they want my opinion, I was like, man, I'm 50 years old. I'm a white and I get all my music for free. Why do you give a shit what I think? And, and, and I end up telling people that you're coming here to be accepted, which seems critically important to having a good career, but the reality is you need to come here and separate yourself and that's hard and that's really hard and i don't think that's changed so um moving forward i hope that that i can i and the people we're with and, and by the way i've seen a plenty of artists writers who've gotten into that thing where they they just become a slave to this town it's not the town's fault i can't find one person to pin it on but i do think there's a couple of there a, a pig-headed idiots like me who who you know would rather take the pile of misfits and see well, you know uh, see what interesting is out there that doesn't exist yet than you know get on the giant ship that i know where it's going cheers to you frank liddell i'm holding up my cheers beer to you, to you brother, man. man thank you so much for being on yeah. the show that, that no. last statement you made is awesome. And the Brent Cobb statement, the Chris Knight stories, your accomplishments. I love the attitude. Can't wait to do it again. Can't wait to hang out with you again, wherever that might be at a hunting camp or in music city, USA. Thank you for being here. Frank Liddell. Likewise. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. That's the one and only Frank Liddell carnival music, Nashville, Tennessee, AKA music city, USA. This life ain't for everybody. This song that we go out with, is a songwriter that I love, and he's friends with Brent Cobb. He's really good friends with Brent Cobb and a lot of other people, including Ben Ratliff, Drake White, John Party. He's written a lot of good songs. And I also thought, in my opinion, that Leith Lofton was going to be a star. He's a character. He's Jerry Reed to me. He can play the guitar like Travis Tritt and Vince Gill. He can write songs. I think Frank Liddell should have a conversation with Leith Lofton, a.k.a. Haas, one day. This song was written by Leith Lofton and Drake White. It's called What You Gonna Do When the Money's All Gone. Thank you all so much for being here. And thank you, Jack Daniels, for being our presenting sponsor. Enjoy it responsibly. Never allow underage drinking. Thank you all. Be safe out there. That's what I think I don't believe even has a bank Make good use of your time on earth